Hey guys, my name's Kadroth, and today I'm going to be going over Morgan Le Fay with you. Now, some of you guys may remember me already analyzing Morgan Le Fay. In fact, I've done this numerous times over the years. I've talked a lot about Morgan Le Fay. She's probably one of our most talked about units in all of FGO. And there's a reason for that. I even have prior videos touching on them. I highly recommend you go watch them. Uh, first and foremost of that is an actual comparison of Morgan Le Fay to Arjuna Alter, because I know that was a hot topic on everyone's mind that I released just not that long ago, in fact. And then on top of that, I also have the Invincible Comp Guide that talks about, you know, one of the select uh, scenarios that she's really good in and also what to do if you don't have her. So if you're someone that's maybe on the fence about Morgan Le Fay, you can watch that Invincible Comp Guide and see how many different options there are actually for the comp. And that may give you some, you know, relief in that regard. But again, I think there's going to be a lot to be said about Morgan Le Fay as she nears here. We're going to probably have her banner coming up on the 6th. I anticipate that uh, that'll be when LB6 goes live after the live stream the day before. So I'm looking forward to it again. I'll be rolling MP5 here on Twitch. So I hope to see you guys for that. But certainly there's going to be a lot of people that are going to ask, you know, do I roll Morgan Le Fay? Do I leave her for later? Uh, again, maybe they, they don't roll for her because they have a unit like Arjuna Alter, or maybe they're looking forward to a unit like Summer Ibuki on in the future. And I'm going to talk about all of that here. <coughs> so again, Morgan Le Fay has been a fantastic unit ever since she came out. Not only were a lot of people hyped for her just because of who she is and her overall design, but I think there were a lot of people that just immediately recognized how good she could be. Historically, looking at her, she is our first 50% charging AoE Berserker. And that alone meant that she represented another jump forward a little bit in farming tech. So let's go ahead and look at her kit overall here. So you guys can see starting off right here, she has 12k attack. That's still a fairly good attack number. Anything 12k and higher, I definitely like to see. It's certainly going to be a nice one for a unit like a Berserker who's going to be effective against just about everyone. Obviously, you're not going to want to take her against foreigners and stuff like that. But again, assuming it's not that one of those sorts of situations, you're going to have uh, basically a field day with how hard you can card with her. And then certainly there, her HP value is going to be anemic in comparison, and that's understandable. But this is actually not that big of a concern for a unit like Morgan Le Fay. I've actually talked about this before, and I think really, even though she has low HP value, she is a Berserker, you know she's going to be squishy, she actually has some nice stuff in her kit to help her deal with that, plus a lot of the ways in which you'll be taking her into comps, especially in a challenge environment, are probably going to see her actually pretty protected. So I don't think you have to worry about it too much, but we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get deeper in. She is Earth Traded here. She has extremely low star absorption and star generation. That is very typical for a Berserker, but I think you'll actually find that the star generation one is actually not that bad for her either. Her NP gain rate here is only 0.53. That's actually kind of pretty average nowadays, but again, this is actually okay given the fact that she actually managed to have two arts cards, as you can see below. This is not normal for a lot of Berserkers. A lot of Berserkers are just kind of stuck in that triple buster deck. They've got that kind of gorilla mindset going on, and they definitely do a lot of damage with it. Morgan Le Fay has the double arts cards here, and so that can actually help her work in some comps where maybe she's got a lot of supports around her for forming triple arts chains. That's really nice in that regard, and then plus she still just has, again, the two arts cards if she does need to actually card to get to an NP. So... Taking a look at that here, she also has a 5% NP charge defense. This is actually not that rare, really, uh, for Berserkers, but still really, really nice to have. It does mean that when she does get hit, every single hit against her will charge her 5%. That is fairly solid, and again, a really nice thing if you think she's going to have to take some punishment. Her death rate overall here is pretty high at 37.3%, but again, that's nothing too crazy either. We see this all the time, and frankly, whenever we're dealing with death on an enemy that's going to be procking on you, you pretty much know that you're going to get procked because the AI just has a much higher chance of success compared to the player when it comes to actually deathing servants. Now, she is lawful evil alignment, and she is female gendered. She also has quite the litany of traits here. She has Artoria Face, Costume Owning, Fae, Humanoid, Sovereign, Servant, 
Seven Night Servant, which is the newer one that uh, Draco added, and then Weak to Enema Elish. So again, there should be at least some stuff in there that you could exploit if you needed to do extra damage against her, if that were to ever happen. Now, again, taking a look at the overall deck here and just kind of giving it a little bit more of a once over here, she does have the two Buster cards, so you can still form a triple Buster chain with her NP. So that is still nice for that purposes. And again, you will see as you're using units like Koi and Skya with her, they do have the ability to allow a unit to charge when they hit with a Buster card. So still having the two Buster cards here is the right choice. I do like the fact that they only went with one quick card. Now, obviously then your quick card is going to be a little bit more anemic there, but it is a four hit count card, which is going to be nice for you. It means it's still going to at least have a high hit count for the purposes of star generation. Um, obviously, you're going to get a little bit of NP generated out of that too, but your, your main bread and butter for NP generation is going to come from those arts cards like we already talked about. And again, her NP gain stat is actually not as bad as it first appears because it does get augmented by the stuff in her kit. But you can see here, basically, all of her hit counts are average. That's really good. Only the quick card is above average there. But still, it's certainly better to have robust hit counts rather than low hit counts. It's going to help out with your overkill uh, percentages. It's also going to help out with, again, your ability to actually generate stars and NP from it. So it is a nice thing to always have more hit counts than less. So again, I do actually really like her deck. I think it suits her very well, and it works for a lot of the uses that you're going to be using her in. Now, let's take a look at her first skill here. She gets Charisma of Desire B. This is going to increase the party's attack for three turns by up to 20%. It's not going to be the strongest here, but the way to think about it is basically, think about it almost like Merlin's or, again, like Castoria's. Whenever they give the attack up to the party, it's only 20% as well. So again, a 20% party-wide attack up here, then it's going to charge her own gauge by 30%. So not party-wide, just herself. But it is going to reduce all enemies' defense as well for three turns. And so the issue with this part is, this is a really strong skill. You have basically 50% worth of steroids here. The problem is 30% of those are not going to be carried over to another wave. So if you do pop this on, say, turn one, if you're in the Koyan Skya system, it's on a six-turn cooldown, so you will get back to it, and you will be able to utilize it again on the final wave where you probably need the damage. The problem is going to be, again, that you can't take it with you unless you're just fighting the same enemy. So if you're fighting the same enemy over and over again, then certainly you're going to have this for the next three turns. And then basically in the three turn duration, if you manage to get back to it, you're going to have it stack again there. And that's going to make for a lot of firepower. But this could be really good, not only for firing off the MP, but also just for making your cards hit uh, a lot harder. So really, really nice to have this. You definitely are going to want it on the turns that you actually need it. That being said, because it's not a five turn cooldown, you're not going to be probably popping this back to back turn. So you're not going to get on a like, say, turns two and then three, which is where you see it being needed in a lot of nodes nowadays. You see that high health enemy in wave two. But we are starting to see some stuff here, especially with the recent lotto here on JP, where all of a sudden they're starting to put a lot more high health enemies in wave one because they know that that puts a lot of pressure on the player in order to have enough damage for turn one when a lot of uh, units tend to ramp their damage over time. So I do think that's one of the reasons why they're doing it in order to put a little bit more pressure, and that's going to help a unit like Morgan Le Fay that has all of the steroid kind of here available turn one. So that's her 30% charge, but then her second skill here has an additional targetable 20% charge. So she could put this on someone else, and you might be thinking, well, why would I do that in a farming comp? Well, there may be some reasons that you might want to get another unit to their MP. We've actually seen this here again in the recent JP Lotto, where there's maybe a wave that can be taken out by someone else, and you can sort of block the unit's uh, NP for later and, and kind of have that on subsequent waves. Maybe you only have enough charge to get that unit to NP twice, but another unit's really close to their NP. So if you could maybe get that NP charge onto the other unit, they can NP and take out a wave. And that's how you can kind of have one of those hybrid clumps and have it work. So that can be really, really good right there. Obviously, she can put this on herself, and this is how she becomes a 50% charge unit. It's really, really strong for her in that regard, especially because it also increases the party's NP gen rate for three turns by up to 25%. So again, really, really solid here with this skill. This kind of functions very similarly to Castoria's, where she also has a targetable charge that has NP gain on it. And so because of that, 
this allows her a little bit of flexibility in how she operates. She can either use it herself and have 50% charge on basically, uh, you know, some way that you can actually double it up there with Queen Sky and get back to it. Or she can operate like a 30% charger in the Koyan Skya system, still be able to three turn as long as you have maxed out her mana loading, and she'd be able to give that charge away to someone else. So that is definitely strong. It can definitely be used to allow for like multi MP turns and stuff like that as well. So there are some nice things to consider about this. Certainly too, if you start looking at it from a challenge perspective, this skill becomes even stronger because this might allow you, let's say you're working in the Invincible comp and you've got Merlin, Morgan, and Castoria. Maybe your Castoria has not quite gotten to her MP and you're worried about having the protection in time. If you actually have this skill, you might be able to put it on her instead and get her to her MP and thus the entire party is protected. So sometimes a skill like this can be really, really useful just to prevent the party from taking damage. So I really do like this. And again, better off than not having it activated. That way you have the MP generation from it so that your cards also generate more. So again, it's a very, very strong skill. And it's also only on a five turn cooldown. So you could, if you manage to double Koyan Sky, basically pop this back to back turns. So that is one of the benefits of having a five turn cooldown versus a six turn. Now, as we look to the third skill here, this one's a bit of a doozy, so I'm going to try to explain it to you in as simple as terms as possible. Just understand that number one here, this is a gut skill. It gives one time over three turn duration here and will revive you with up to 3000 HP. Now, on top of that, it's also going to increase Morgan Le Fay's crit star absorption for three turns by 5000%. That is extremely strong. That is strong enough to be able to soak the cards, or sorry, be able to soak the stars the stars to the cards that you need so this is always an issue with berserkers and avengers they typically have very low star weight so it's hard to get stars on them without just flooding the party with stars but if you have a star absorption skill that's this strong you can still get all the stars so this is really really nice i i did the comparison to arjuna altar earlier before and i talked about how well he does have a skill like this his is focused primarily on his buster cards this helps Morgan Le Fay soak it to all of her cards. Now, that may be better, that may be worse. It just depends on the situation. Maybe you have too many cards and it spreads the stars thin. Or maybe it gets the car the stars to the buster cards that you want to hit uh, really hard with. Or maybe even to the arts cards that allow you to crit and get back to an NP. That can definitely happen. I've seen it basically where Morgan got both of her arts cards. She crit with both and she's just ready to NP again. Which is a really, really strong aspect to her, I think. Now, top that off here with additional crit damage for three turns of 30%. It's not, you know, a crazy 100% crit damage addition here, but 30% is still nothing to sneeze at. That is still a really, really good amount of crit damage to be added. On top of that, it grants her a regeneration buff for three turns. Now, don't get confused by this. Just think it's a skill that activates every turn for three turns, right? So it's basically to reduce all enemies attack for one turn over three turns. So each turn, it reapplies to the enemy, reducing their attack for that turn. It's really good in that regard. It's going to reduce their, their overall attack by 20%. So this is just going to cut down on the damage incoming to the party. Then on top of that, it's also going to reduce their critical attack chance one turn every turn for three turns. So again, every single turn is going to activate a critical attack chance reduction for that turn. And that's 20%. And with the way that this works as well, crit chance reductions on the enemy tend to function in multiples of five. So getting something in there that's negative 20%, this is actually enough to stop a lot of units from even being able to crit against you. And it's really, really nice because it's going to help protect uh, Morgan Le Fay with that sort of squishy amount of HP. One of the big things that Berserkers are always concerned with is getting one shot basically by a stray crit. So this is going to reduce the odds of that happening for her. And it's tied to her gut skill. So you will have the guts there also to protect you. So it's one of the things I really like about her kit. And as if all of that wasn't enough, right here at the end, you also just get a flat 15 stars when you use the skill. This is not per turn, but it is just a very nice crit star bomb. So she'll get the crit damage, the crit stars, and the absorption. So it's a three in one perfect crit skill. It soaks the stars to her that it generated itself and it allows it to crit harder. So I do really like this skill. I think her guts is, is sort of like 
one of those overlooked aspects to Morgan Le Fay that really actually just helps her out in a lot of challenge scenarios. The downside to this is it is on a seven turn cooldown, but hey, it's still a really solid skill, so you understand why it has a little bit longer, uh, you know, cooldown to get back to it there. Oddly enough, they do end up giving her Madness Enhancement B, which does help out her two Buster cards there for a little bit extra performance. She gets Magic Resistance A that's going to improve her debuff resistance by 20%. Item Construction EX that's going to increase her own debuff success rate by 12%. This one really shouldn't be coming into play too much. Now, again, she has Territory Creation B here as well to further improve her Arts card performance. So... This is really nice for that NP gain that we talked about. So not only does she have 50% uh, charge in her kit, not only does she have 25% extra NP gain, she's also got territory creation here to help it out even further. Then she also gets Fey Eyes A that increases her own critical attack chance resistance by 20%. Now, the reason I mentioned this and the reason this is actually low-key pretty strong Remember what I just said about having crit chance down, reducing a lot of enemies' capability to crit? This is her natural passive that she always has of 20%. So when you pop that gut skill, you can almost guarantee that anything short of a Spriggan with a shit ton of crit chance ups is not going to crit her. It's really, really nice that she has this. She is basically an anti-crit berserker. And that's actually why as we go here to talk about the append skills here, Morgan Le Fay's third append, we've already talked about this for a lot of Berserkers, it's really not that useful because it's so niche, but on a unit like Morgan Le Fay, it's even less useful because this would put her at potentially up to negative 70% chance to crit. There are very few enemies out there that could even stack enough to be able to exceed this. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that is pretty much your last priority for your append skills with her. Now, what I will tell you here, though, is the extra attack finesse is certainly going to be useful for her, especially if you're in more of a solo environment or you just find yourself wanting to form a lot of chains. Maybe you want Morgan Le Fay to be really powerful for you. Maybe she's going to be a unit that you roll extra MP copies of. And so for that, extra attack finesse is always going to be solid for you. It's not only more damage, it's more star gen and more MP gen. So it's really, really a good thing to have here, up to 50% more. Now... The second skill, though, is the one I typically tell a lot of people to go with, and you may be wondering why necessarily do you need mana loading on a unit like Morgan Le Fay? Well, I just explained to you that even if you were to take away the second skill here and use it on someone else, you could basically still start Morgan Le Fay out with 50% charge skill CE with her mana loading and basically use her 30% charge skill there turn one. You do double Koyan Skaya from there, and that gets you enough charge to do turn two. And then basically now, because of the cooldown, she has her 30% charge skill back, and she basically could roll in with an Oberon as the third support, or heck, even just her own 20% charge skill there. And either way, uh, you know, with another 50% charger at that point, you would have enough still to get to 100%. So it makes her really malleable, it makes her really solid, and she can still spare that 20% for someone else. So it's really, really good there. But even in spite of that, there may be some uses where maybe like, for instance, you're in the middle of a lotto. Maybe you don't have MLB of the craft essence yet. Maybe it gives 30% charge because of that. Well, a unit like Morgan Le Fay, if she has her mana loading, then can basically start at 50% even without having the MLB CE then. And so as a result, she can get the 50% from her skills turn one, still get the 50% on turn three over there, get the 50-50 from Koyan Skaya, and then certainly all you need turn three is 50% charge. Now, you could use an Oberon and have Overkill, but yeah. This is why it's really, really strong sometimes for even your 50% chargers to have mana loading, is because they may be able to operate with less starting charge. Or maybe it's just part of a hybrid comp where you're just trying to get Morgan Le Fay to take out a wave while someone else does a lot of the heavy lifting. It's still a good reason to have mana loading. It makes the units have more options, more strategies that you can employ for your comp structure. So it's why I say mana loading is just such a strong a pin to have on almost anyone. Now, as we get to her Noble Phantasm here, this one is what a lot of people have a tendency to talk about. So... She is a six hit AOE buster NP. She increases her own damage against round table, knight, or fey enemies by 50% for one turn. Now, the thing you should clue in on here is when it says one turn like this, 
this means that it's a power mod it is not restricted just to the np so it's not super effective damage so the downside is it doesn't scale as good it's not as multiplicative with as many other damage sources but the upside is it affects everything for the turn so even card damage and extra attacks can gain the benefit of this 50 percent extra damage after her np so it's a really solid thing depending on what you're up against but still round table knight and fey are not two fairly common niches that you'll encounter so it is what it is this is just icing on the cake if you manage to be able to take advantage of it now then she's going to deal damage to all enemies and then she'll inflict a curse status with 1000 damage for five turns to them so the way i like to think about this is as long as the fight goes on long enough to receive it this is basically 5000 extra damage and then on top of that she's going to overcharge the party's np by one stage for one time over three turns this is a big reason why morgan Le Fay is a really nice option for the invincible comp because not only does this charge herself, sorry, overcharge herself, it's also going to overcharge everybody else in the party. So all the supports like Merlin, he's going to get more stars per turn. Castoria, you're going to get more stacks of solemn defense. So it's really a nice thing to have. And it's one of the things that I really like about her is because it's tied to her NP and not a skill, you have it every single time you're probably going to need it. Every single time you're going to be sitting there operating in a three-turn cadence in that Invincible system, that's where you're really going to like and enjoy having this. Now, again, even still, this could be used to overcharge someone else's NP in somewhat of a hybrid farming comp or something like that. Or again, if you're just managing to get back to her NP within a three-turn cadence, that can even be used to overcharge her own overcharge effect here, which as you can see, is super effective damage to anyone with the man attribute now i've heard a lot of people basically talk about this with regards to koyan skaya saying that it's redundant a lot of the times and that you don't really need it because koyan skaya gives extra damage that's man well koyan skaya gives extra damage that's man traded in a power mod sense this is super effective so regardless of koyan skaya giving that this is scaling multiplicatively with it that's one of the beauties of having super effective damage is it doesn't matter what other effects you have going on, it will scale multiplicative with them. So it makes it so strong because it's unique in how it operates. Now, again here, it's an extra 150% right there. So it's really, really solid. I do think that is going to be really nice because there's obviously basically a third of the game ends up being man trait. It doesn't work out exactly like that, but there's certainly a large portion of enemies that have that trait. And so as a result, Morgan Le Fay can do a lot of extra damage to units. Now, the big questions and concerns that I often hear about with Morgan Le Fay is what if the enemy is not man traded? And that is a concern. That is probably her chief concern as we move forward here is it's not that she is a bad unit, but certainly if you're not facing a man attributed enemy, that is not a round table knight or fey either. They have a tendency to just not take a lot of damage from her. This doesn't mean that Morgan Le Fay's damage is bad, especially in the Oberon era. We can still just make people go crazy with the amount of numbers that they're able to produce. But it does mean that you're going to have some concern for that, especially if you're operating at, say, like NP1. Obviously, you hear about a lot of people that roll around with their NP5, level 120 Morgan Le Fay, and they're able to just, you know, glide right through a lot of content. So the question I think a lot of you will have is, do you need more than the NP1? I have an NP1 grailed on JP. Yes, certainly there were times that NP1 even grailed doesn't cut it. Most of those times, though, I either had another option to take or I basically just said, hey, this is like some 90 plus plus content and I maybe don't care about three turning or I maybe don't care to use her for that. So a lot of the time you'll still be fine at an NP1. She will still cover the majority of the needs that you need as long as you have the appropriate supports to actually allow her damage to scale. So that is one of the things I really hear a lot of people talking about with her and a lot of people end up concerned. Now, right here we have the NP damage list and I've talked with you guys about this before. Remember, these numbers are all neutral numbers and they are meant more for a comparative sake, not for like actual hard numbers. Plus, it's only taking into account a unit's self buffs. So for instance, a unit like Arjuna Alter will appear at the top of the list up here 
but this is assuming that he lands his debuff in order to be able to proc the extra damage from his first skill. If he doesn't, or if the target is debuff immune, his numbers actually plummet here. So it's a big thing to understand why. Even with a unit like Fran, Fran actually appears way high up here and does a lot of damage, but this is uh, assuming that it's the one target that has defense down that she has in her kit. The other targets will take less damage, and so these numbers can be a little bit, you know, confusing for people sometimes. They can give people basically the wrong idea. In Morgan Le Fay's case, this is her actual true numbers. It is, again, neutral, so not effective. And as you guys know, Berserkers are basically always going to be at least 1.5 times effective, as long as they're not going up against a foreigner. And so, as a result, you can basically num uh, multiply these numbers by 1.5 to get an actual idea, but this still isn't including things like support buffs. So it is a decent idea to at least see where she uh, lies in regards to this. And you can see other units like uh, Miyamoto Musashi or, again, Ibuki Doji Berserker that are kind of still a little bit ahead of her. You can even see a unit like Raiko that's way ahead of her. But you have to consider, too, that there are units out here that, for instance, don't have charge. So that's going to be Raiko's big issue is can you get Raiko to three turn? Odds are probably not, not without some carding luck or something like that, which still requires you to low roll on the NP and maybe not finish it off clean. So that is always going to be one of the concerns there for a unit like Raiko. But even still, Morgan Le Fay, and the one thing that she's always going to have is going to be that man attribute super effective modifier. And so as a result, I think what you guys are going to be dealing with here is going to be far more this 40k number than anything else. Certainly, you may encounter scenarios that aren't going to be using the man attribute, and so that's going to uh, make your, your damage call into question. But as long as you have, again, robust supports, it should be good as long as you're not in some sort of crazy high-level content. Even then, she can still overcome a lot of the high-level content because a lot of it is man-traded. So the only concern is if it's not. And then, like I said, you probably just want to find other potential solutions. That being said, Morgan Le Fay is a really, really adaptable unit, I feel like, over time. You guys end up having a lot of things that you can do to allow her to operate in various other systems. It's not all about farming with a unit like her. And so as a result, I've had people ask me over the years if I could only have like one of these LB6 units, which one would I have? And I think, you know, factoring out the supports and stuff like that, I've basically said that I, th I felt like I'd rather have Morgan Le Fay because of just how usable she is for challenge content and stuff like that. And I've had people argue with me on this over the years, basically saying that, like, you know, a unit like Melison can really pop off and do a lot of damage. And that's true. But often I feel like a lot of times people are basically also assuming higher NP levels. And so that's something to keep in mind here. Because if you're going to assume a higher NP level of another unit, you can pretty much then, at least to be fair, assume a higher NP level of a unit like Morgan Le Fay. And then certainly at something like that, NP5 neutral damage here, so you could multiply it by 1.5 and still then factor in everything else. You'd still be looking at 40k right there. And then with man trait, you'd basically be looking at, again, 66k here, which for raw numbers, that's pretty damn solid. So I think that's the important thing to understand is that if you're going to compare things, try to make sure you're doing somewhat of an even comparison. Try to make sure you're giving everybody a fair shake. Because I do see a lot of people skewing numbers basically to suit their narratives. Just understand, all of these units can be good if they're used appropriately. And a unit like Morgan Le Fay, the best thing that I can say for her is that she is more than just being a one trick. She has a lot of uses. And that 50% charge can be really nice at times. So, again, I think she is a very solid option for you guys as an AoE Berserker. Now, a lot of people would probably ask me, okay, well then, Cad, what craft essences do you want to use on a unit like Morgan Le Fay? Well, certainly if you're going to be using her in some sort of invincible comp that you know is going to be lasting for a long time, a, like a, a craft essence like Black Grail is going to be really solid for her because you're just going to be trying to pop off as hard as you can with the NP damage. Certainly, if you're trying to go for something like Buster Crits or even Arch Crits, you can go for Victor of the Moon or something like that or another ending. Either one of those can be really uh, decent options for you depending on what you're actually targeting there. 
But then obviously for your generalistic farming purposes, I'm gonna say there's probably two big ones that you wanna keep your eye out for. Number one is going to be Aerial Drive. This one's going to come back this year during the Halloween rerun. You guys should be able to get this for free, all five copies from the shop. Do not miss that. Make sure you guys get it because this is a very solid craft essence over time. And while it has gotten ever so slightly edged out by a couple other craft essences, it is still really, really good. So that's going to be the big one that I'm going to tell you guys from a welfare standpoint. Then next year during the Bunyan collab event, you guys are going to be able to get your hands on cranking and cranking is another really, really solid one that basically ends up having a little bit extra MP damage here. Each one of these was all attack scaling. Each one of these was 50% charge and each one of these gave buster and MP damage. This one gives a little bit less buster, 2% less than, than aerial drive, but it gives 5% more MP damage than aerial drive did. So with units like Oberon that can have that multiplicative scaling on MP damage sources, this can be even better. So it is a really, really nice craft essence that I, again, highly recommend you guys don't miss. Those are going to be sort of your go-tos for farming purposes. You may be able to pull off other things. You don't necessarily just have to go with that. Now, at least with regards to the uh, banner, and this is something that I see come up for a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people say, well, Morgan Le Fay has four different banners. Why do I need to roll the first one? You don't necessarily have to. In fact, I'm going to say if you're operating on a budget, yes, delay. There are other banners that she will have, including probably one right after 6.3. Basically, that's going to allow you to uh, have another shot of rolling for her after the Gauntlet of Kayanskaya and Oberon are done. Certainly, then, she'll have others later on down the line that you might be able to target, so you don't have to roll her here. I think the big reasons to roll on day one for Morgan Le Fay are, one, Coup Caster, who, again, anyone that just did the Assassin node on JP realized that Coup Caster is really solid for farming nowadays. He's, a, he's one of those rare buster units that is able to operate from 0% charge. And if you can manage to roll more copies of him, you can actually get enough coins for him to unlock his mana loading. If you manage to unlock Coup Caster's mana loading, you can actually manage to three turn from zero only with double Koyan Skaya, no other support needed. That can be really strong. That can be really fast. So it's one of the nice advantages to rolling that first banner. Certainly there, you also are going to be able to get your hands on uh, Barghest and, um, and Balbon Sith, and both of those are going to be widely desired units, not just because they're decent in their own right, but also because they can be challenge and solo machines. They're very good in Grail Fronts, they're very good in soloing some of the Super Recollection quests, and so I have definitely used both of them prolifically in that regard, and they're one of the big reasons that I would actually promote them to you guys. They will be available on more than just Morgan Le Fay's banner, but certainly if you're rolling Morgan Le Fay, that's going to be an easy ticket to acquiring them. So I do recommend that first banner, but certainly not if you guys are trying to operate on a budget. So again, I hope that answered all of your questions with regards to Morgan Le Fay. I hope that set your mind at ease about her damage concern. She's actually really good in spite of everything. And then certainly she can be used in the Invincible Comp, but you don't have to use her. There are other options for you there. So don't feel like you have to have her, but definitely feel like if you get her that you have gotten yourself a very good unit. So again, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you guys for the next one. Later.